Um, that said, I do want to read something um, from that from that man from today. Um, but of course, I'm not going to be able to find it with relative ease. You know, we're just going to move on. Here's the reality. There's a little bit of mindset associated with uh, these shows. It's why it's called Mindset and Mortgages. And one of the things in my message this morning to all was, hey, you know what? You are unique. And what you do is unique to you it matters. And my husband, bless him, sent me a message today. He sends me a little daily motivational message and he sent it today. And it almost perfectly mirrored what I posted in that this morning. We all get wrapped up in comparing ourselves to other people and other things. And the reality is you are made uniquely and that makes you special. And I have the great, great pleasure of introducing Scott tonight, Mr. Peacekeeper, who is such a unique combination, a rare combination of things. An, an attorney, right, who is also a CDFA, a Certified Divorce Financial Analyst, who has chosen to make a career in is his main line of his career in mediation. And so that makes you a rare breed, I think you said, Scott, right? Welcome. Thank you, Carrie, for having me. And I've been called special my entire life, not <laughs> for the right reasons. So I appreciate you having me. Oh, well, we're grateful to have you on. And I've got a number of questions that have come in from others, as well as um, just myself here today. And we're going to talk about kind of all things family law. But as we get started, and we're talking about mediation in particular, talk to us about, Scott, how you decided mediation versus litigation and you know, what that journey looked like and maybe what the difference is for those who are listening that, that have no idea. Sure. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, so I was a litigator for a number of years. That's a person that uh, one party to a litigation would, would, would hire and, uh, and we would go to court versus the other party. And in family law, uh, the first thing that I did with my clients, and I haven't been to court and family law since before 2013, so it's a long time ago, but um, the first thing that really all family law attorneys do is that they ask their clients, it, when, when they're hired for litigation, is they ask their clients for basically a position statement. And that is all the gunk that happened between the two uh, married people. And so it's all the bad stuff um, and all the, just the icky stuff. And the reason is, is that as a, as a litigator, you have to position your client against the other side in order to portray your client as the innocent spouse. Sure. And, um, and so, you know, the average divorce is taking a little over two years now. And basically, it's, it's, it's a two-year process of looking the wrong direction. So you're looking behind you where you've been, and, uh, and you're stuck in that mindset for two years or so, and you spend a whole lot of money uh, just because the system eats the money up. And it's just a really unfun, bad, yucky place to be for that long of a period of time. So... Um, I like to, for when I was representing clients, I kind of came to a slow realization that I hadn't won any cases for my clients mm. uh, when I was in litigation. Now, sure, I won lots of cases, but uh, none of them were as well off as they should have been. And so one day uh, after a particularly bad experience, I just decided that I wasn't going to be a party any longer to something that yeah, it made my, my family and I money, mm -hmm. but there should be something more to life than just that. Mm -hmm. And I was unhappy and I really blamed it on what I did for a living because I have a great family and a lot of support and, and I've always been a happy person. 
Um, but what I was doing for a living was just make, was grinding me in the wrong direction. So in 2013, I stopped, I opened up a mediation practice and essentially what mediation does is that, uh, I work with both people in a divorce scenario. So we basically form a team and it's in its team us. And on the other side are the problems of divorce. Sure. So when someone engages me, um, they um, sign a form that says we're not going to talk uh, or spend a lot of time um, fighting with each other and bringing up all that stuff that got us here. We know why we're here. Mm -hmm. And if you really are ready to move forward with the divorce process, then, then we're going to work together to find creative solutions. Um, and that's what I love to do. That's my strength. Um, and it's always been, I've, I've owned several businesses. And so I, I really love delving into, you know, just being creative and, and problem focused. And how do we get these two people from point A to point B without, um, you know, causing added emotional damage to them, their kids and, um, and stripping them of all their money. Right. Well, speaking of that, I mean, I, I guess we've, we've spent a fair amount of time together, right? So I, I already know, but I've heard stories about, and you kind of alluded to it in your earlier statements around, hey, you know, people both lawyer up on both sides and we're going to litigation and all of a sudden money is depleted. There's, there's all of a sudden there's no savings left. We've vested all kinds of money in doing this and gotten nowhere. On average, do you know, like how much of a cost savings are we talking about between heading into mediation versus litigation? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that our, our fee is somewhere between five and 10% of the cost of a litigated divorce. Um, so it's pretty significant. Um, and one thing I like to, that I think is difficult to measure though, is the, it's definitely the most economic path. I mean, if you're looking for a less expensive path to separation, then mediation is a great option. But what you can't measure is the emotional pain savings that mm -hmm. we can deliver because you're not stuck for two years. Our average case lasts less than six weeks. Okay. So do you want to be in the divorce for two years or do you want to move forward in six weeks? Right. And that time savings and that, um, and that like uh, being stuck for yeah. that extended length of period of time that not having to go through that is just a difficult thing to measure. Right. But um, I mean, it's, it's an important factor in someone's decision. Well, sure. It's a huge emotional savings. Now you and I were talking about that um, a couple of weeks ago in terms of just, you know, the outcomes and that often as a mediator, you're not necessarily involved in the final outcome, right? So what, what, are the most common issues that do get resolved in mediation and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's, well, there's really three main areas that in family law mediation I work in. Um, I love working in the premarital space. So um, you might have heard of, of a prenup or a prenuptial agreement. So that's an agreement uh, that um, people usually make during their engagement period. Um, but the traditional way that that's made is that the, you know, the higher earner, the person that wants that has you know stuff to protect, sure. they meet with a lawyer and uh, they come up with this really one-sided you know super aggressive uh, agreement and they kind of hand it to the other person. Sure. And, um, and that's kind of a bummer for the other person because they don't feel like um, they've been respected or had a chance to be heard or validated. Right. And the agreement when they take it to a lawyer typically is extremely one-sided. I mean, the boilerplate um, you know, text of these prenuptial agreements is super broad and unfair. And yeah. so the way that I work in the prenuptial space, in the pre-marriage, like before marriage, is, that, is the same way that I work kind of in the divorce, is that um, both parties that are engaged or about to be married come in and see me, or we do it over Zoom these days. Um, and That's where we gotta do everything these <laughs> days, right? <laughs> of course. It's the Zoom age. Um, and basically, 
uh, we figure out what it is that the, the one person wants to protect and we, and we narrowly tailor an agreement that accomplishes what they're interested in, but doesn't um, unnecessarily harm the other person by giving rights uh, that, the, that, the, that the higher earning spouse wouldn't be entitled to, um, you know, had they been without that agreement. So I really love doing the premarital space because basically um, what I hear from my clients is that they become closer during the process because it's the first time that they have ever really had real talk about their finances, their goals, their fears, um, and it, it brings the, it's tough, you know, it's real talk. I didn't have that talk with my wife before we got married, um, but the parties that come in and see me, they feel, they feel closer because they've been heard and validated. They've, they've, uh, they feel like both each other have uh, really gone out of their way to make them, you know, feel comfortable and in, in, in open in their discussions. So it's a really rewarding conversation um, and, and we come up with fair agreements again. So uh, I love working uh, with parties before they're married. married. Well, I wish everybody would do something like that. Not necessarily a prenuptial agreement, but I can't tell you how many times as a mortgage lender, you're sitting across the table from, or of course on Zoom today, and talking about credit and debts and income and the look of surprise on one or the other party's faces associated with financial matters. You know, it's just one of those things that finances are so intimate. And of course you're getting married, but you know, to be able to have that open kind of financial counseling session, if you will. Um, I mean, I know you're not necessarily a mediator, not a counselor, but you know, to go through all of that and lay it all out on the table and have that conversation with a third party who's helping you navigate the way has got to be truly helpful and would be for a variety of the people that I've been on the opposite side of the table from for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure who they would go to if they, if they weren't doing it with like for a prenup, but, mm -hmm. or a premarital agreement. But um, I mean, whoever that person is, or if it's a CPA or whatever, that, that would be a good exercise for people. Well, I think it's a, I think it's fantastic. So you said three, so that's, that was number one. What's number that's two? A, that's a good part heading into the marriage. And then unfortunately, <laughs> it's um, dealing with people that are going out of the marriage. Um, mm -hmm. And in and, and the way that I work again, like I get calls all day from people that want to engage a mediator, but they also want to start telling me all about their case. Mm -hmm. And they want to ask me all sorts of questions about, you know, how can I be advantaged over the other person? And, and the first thing that I do when someone calls me is I explain to them that, um, you know, my goal is to help them leave the marriage just as they came into it, which was, which is together. Right. Uh, and so an ethical mediator is a neutral mediator, someone that kind of represents the futures of both parties. And in a way, if they have young children, the children themselves, um, because we're trying to protect their assets and set up a good parenting plan and, and, and help them uh, learn to communicate during the divorce process in a way that helps them become good co-parents. Co um, so a big part of our practice is the divorce mediation space. And then the final is post-divorce. So there's all sorts you know, about 50% of cases that are litigated and divorced, the parties end up back in court after the divorce at some point. So there's, it doesn't feel great for either party to be taken, like, you know, quote unquote, taken back to court, you know, post-divorce. It, it brings up a lot of hurt feelings and it's, court's not a fun place to be. It's scary. Um, it's expensive. Uh, so we do a ton of post-divorce mediation, helping people, uh, come up with creative solutions to whatever issues they're having, whether it's co-parenting or, um, you know, they need to adjust or they have a desire to adjust spousal support or child support. Um, you might've heard like a lot of uh, famous Hollywood actors and actresses right now are trying to reduce their support obligations because they aren't um, working as much. So although assets and debts are the division of those assets and debts are final um, when you sign the divorce um, agreement uh, support like spousal support or child support 
those are things that continue to be held open for the court and can be adjusted over time. Sure. And um, so those are, those are other things that we, that we help people resolve. So Scott, how many of your, I mean, I, I don't even know if you know the answer to this question because we, we didn't talk about it, but I'm just curious, how many of those types of mediation conversations stay out of court altogether because you're in that space and you're able to come to some sort of agreement without it even going to court or do they all still go to court in the end what i mean what does that look like yeah i mean so if we're successful then um then we will if there's if there's a need to file something with the court then my then we'll file with the court letting the court know hey we've adjusted this per private agreement and they've signed the two parties have signed and and we just want you to know judge because in case it needs to be enforceable later sure. you know we're letting you know and the judge goes oh whatever this is great uh, <laughs> so they sign whatever it is because sure, that's what they do yeah whatever they don't they they want people to come out come to private uh agreement like they sure. they they want to encourage that so they give a, a great leeway to 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 make those um sort of private agreements for enforceable yeah. um but yeah i mean if two parties are coming to me in the post-divorce scenario um, and they're agreeing to go into mediation, they both know that they didn't like the court experience the first time sure. uh, that they were it, if they were there and they would rather figure it out themselves with the help of a professional. So a, a really, really high percentage of those um, discussions end up in a successful mediated agreement. So that's awesome. I love to hear that there's a huge percentage of those that, and, and I know mediation has, has skyrocketed in terms of um, an option, right? Like I, I, can, I can think about back, unfortunately, more than 20 years ago when I was in the position where I was getting divorced and that wasn't even, that wasn't even something people mentioned. It wasn't even an option, right? It was just what you did was you went and you got an attorney. And if you didn't get an attorney, you could pretty well guarantee that you were going to be in rough shape on the other side of that. Um, so I, I know there's still a space, unfortunately, where people do need to hire attorneys and there does need to be litigation in your personal opinion when would those times be or how do you know when you actually need to be in a situation where there's litigation versus mediation? Yeah, so for speaking of divorce, I, th I think it's super important that anybody start mediation. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't always mean that we are going to come up with a, with a whole agreement on every aspect of the separation. Right. But, but it's really important, especially when you're dealing with a person or one or both parties that might be have like kind of some narcissism to them. Sure. Uh, the, the reason that I suggest everyone start in mediation is because we will come to a lot of agreements. Mm -hmm. There will absolutely be a lot of things that you guys will agree on. Yeah. Now, if we can't agree on everything, the benefit of the mediation is that you can take what we've agreed on and set it aside then hire attorneys to go to court on what's left. But you're limiting the scope of that representation to just what's left. So your fees will be drastically reduced. Got the it. time that you're gonna be in court is less. Um, and it's very likely because you have sat across from each other in the virtual Zoom world at least, uh, right. you, you have agreed on stuff with the help of a, of a, of a third party. So it's going to be very likely that you're going to be more willing to agree um, in the, even during litigation than you would if you just started out in litigation and said, let's do this, maybe, uh, yeah. you know, let's run up some fees and, and go to war. Yeah. Um, so it's just important because, I mean, right off the bat, you could agree on 65% of what, what there is to your divorce and then let's leave the other 35% to the litigators but it's still gonna save you a lot of time and a lot of money doing it that way. 
Yeah, no, I, I can respect and appreciate that entirely. And I imagine that those things that people don't agree on runs the gamut, like those, that, that remaining uh, 35% or whatever the case might be, uh, could be a variety of different things, of course. Yeah. I mean, it could be like really important things like a parenting plan for the kids. And it could be like for less important things, not less important per se, but you know, um, like, you know, dog parenting plan. Right. Um, you right. know, like things that are, dogs are pretty important to me, Scott. I'm just going to say well, I have three of them. <laughs> I have them all in my bedroom so that they couldn't be heard right now. Cause they'd be screaming. I get it. I get it. No. We yeah, are. I mean, it could be like, I mean, you never know in a in a divorce what what is sure. emotionally uh, triggering or you know, true what what issue may have true like economic value that parties can't come to right. on. It's 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 runs it it really does you know run the gamut. Run the gamut, sure. Are there any questions, Scott, that I haven't asked you that you feel like, hey, it's really important that I think people understand this about the mediation process or what it is that you do on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. Um, so what I like to, uh, everyone really focuses on their assets and debts, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, money is like, you know, is a huge issue. So, um, but that's what mediators are really, uh, you know, and certified divorce financial analysts. I mean, that's what we're best at helping people with. What I like to say to people if they're preparing for a divorce, I love when clients can both go to a parenting expert and have that parenting expert help cultivate a parenting plan for sure. them or with them. So there are parenting experts out there in Southern California, all over the country that, that work on Zoom and work with people all over the country that basically um, the parenting plans, the way that you can share your children the, there, there are so many different ways that you can word that. Um, and if you can go see a parenting expert, um, you know, during your mediation or before your mediation um, and have that person really help, um, help create a plan that's specific to your family and your needs. I really think that uh, that is something that, um, that is, can be really beneficial because lawyers and me mediators um, you know, we aren't psychologists and we know all the different parenting plans, but, and we can certainly write them down, but, you know, whether we're trained to really understand the best parenting option for you and your family, that's different. Mm -hmm. And so I really love when my clients work with the parenting expert to really focus on the children, because it also shows a degree of compassion and care for each other that you can still right talk through this issue because you know lawyers um, aren't going to be there in five years when you have a disagreement about your parenting plan or your you know your support issues you will need to communicate with this other person especially if you have minor children for probably a very long time yeah. uh, if not forever i was gonna say forever so far in my experience right <laughs> even with adult children um so and then the other thing i just want to mention uh is you know my clients that um, that negotiate most effectively because unfortunately divorce really is a business negotiation to, at some extent, to some extent, yeah. that's really what it is. It's not a past focused exercise. It's future focused. So for you to be future focused um, and in a, in as good of a headspace as you can be, because it's a really can be a trying emotional experience. Um, you need to do things for yourself. Now, whatever that is, if it's exercise, if it's seeing a psychologist, if it's, if it's working with a divorce coach, if it's talking with your brothers and sisters, whatever it is that makes you feel better about yourself, you need to do a whole lot of that yeah. um, during this process. Um, I really feel like that's an important uh, you know, part of the game. Uh, and you know, the better you feel about yourself, the better co-parent you're going to be, the better parent you're going to be. Um, you know, and better person that you're going to be because you're really going to help yourself be future focused. Uh, and, you know, also, like, if you haven't been working, uh, at, like full time, but now you might have to start, you know, mm -hmm. start getting your, uh, you know, ducks in a row for your, you know, see a professional uh, consultant, like, what, what do you want to do with your career? 
you know, start doing things that make you feel like you're inching forward. And yeah. all of those things will make you feel better uh, during the process. Well, and that's a, that's a great mindset message overall, regardless of where you are in life, right? Uh, we've got to spend some time focusing inward so that we take care of ourselves. We're better externally in the world, but particularly while you're going through divorce or separation or, you know, any kind of um, tremendously stressful thing in life, right? the situation we're in right now, right? With with COVID and all of that, all, all good to focus on self-care and whatever that can look like in your life. Yeah. Scott, in terms of communicating with you, I know we talked about, and you already mentioned, obviously you're, you're in San Diego, um, but you, from a mediation perspective, um, you can help people nationwide, right? From a mediation perspective, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, well, yeah, I, my, uh, my email, I guess, is Scott Levin Mediation. So it's S-C-O-T-T-L-E-V-I-N, uh, the word mediation, at gmail.com. Um, and our phone number, 858-255-1321. And I just asked the, uh, everyone to think about what's the price of peace? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going through trying times. Uh, I would love people to try to stick it out um, because we're all struggling, especially this fall with schools being closed, at least in where I live. It's I'm not going to be right. But, um, you know, if you can't stick it out, though, and you really want to try to move on, then start in mediation. Do yourself a favor. If it's not with me, uh, I'm not everyone's person, and that's totally fine. But there are some incredible professionals throughout the country. That, um, that can help you. Well, I count you as one, and one of the best things that I heard from you in our most recent one-on-one -on -one conversation was that a lot of times people don't arrive at the place. A lot of times through mediation, people figure out how to work things out and stick it out longer. And I love, 